Okay, um, thank you. So, hello everyone. Um, my name is Wojtek Tyczyński and I'm like six scalability TL for ever, almost. Um, uh, at least that's, that's my feeling. Um, so I'm with this community for eight and a half years um, at this point-ish. So, um, and, and today I'm going to, to, to give this presentation about six, what, six scalable, what we are doing in six scalability, um, both the introduction and, and a little bit more um, of a deep dive. Um, so let's start what we, what, uh, with talking what we are doing as part of six scalability. And there are a couple, couple different um, categories of things. So um, first we define and drive what scalability of Kubernetes really is. It's, um, as, as you will see in a moment, like it's, it's not really obvious. And what are our goals uh, um, in terms of where, where we would like the system to, to, to get. Um, we, based on that, like we coordinate and contribute the actual improvements to, to, to reach those goals that we defined. Um, we, monitor and measure the system um, and performance of the system to, to actually see that our goals were really reached um, based, on, based on the actual um, system behavior. Um, we protect the system from scalability regressions. That's, that's probably one of the most important things. Um, and, and finally, we um, coach the community and consult many different, many different improvements or many different um, features that are happening across the, 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 the whole um, Kubernetes area. Um, one more note um, here is um, we are at least sometimes confused with like the auto-scaling SIG. Those are two different things. Um, here we are, we are focusing in SIG scalability. We are focusing on like the overall um, performance of the system, how, how far you can go, how, how far you can push certain, um, certain limits um, of, of Kubernetes. Auto SIG auto scaling is focused on how to um, how to horizontally or vertically scale like uh, certain aspects of the system. So, for example, horizontal pod auto scaling or cluster auto scaling is, is part of auto SIG auto scaling, um, and it's sometimes um, being confused by people. So, um, it's not what we are doing here in SIG scalability. Um, okay, so. Let's start with the, the first thing, defining and driving. Um, so what, what is actually Kubernetes scalability? Um, and I think that the most important thing, which is not like specific to Kubernetes itself, but um, it's, it's important to keep in mind that um, we shouldn't be optimizing the system for the sake of optimizing itself. Um, it's important, like every single optimization is making the system a little bit more complex, harder to debug, harder to reason about, and so on. So it's important to always anchor all the optimizations in the actual like user needs. Um, so if we really ask users what, what they really want, um, is it, they are often like saying they want scalable clusters and so on. They want Kubernetes to be as scalable as possible, but if we really ask them further what, what that really means, um, that isn't obvious for them. And in many cases, it's, it's not that they don't know, they don't even want to know um, what that is, because they, they want the system, they want to focus on their own business and they want the system to just work for them. And they don't want to understand all the, all the details of the system, how that works, how they interact with each other and so on. Um, so what we did is, we historically thought about Kubernetes scalability in terms of like size of the cluster or number of nodes, but it's, it's not really true, or it's, at least it's not the full truth at this time. Um, Kubernetes scalability is like a multi-dimensional problem with many different dimensions. Um, um, like, and number of nodes or size of the cluster is actually only one of the, the, those many dimensions. Like number of secrets, number of load balancers, number of persistent volumes, number of uh, pods in the cluster, and so on. Th those are all like dimensions that like affect and that affect the scalability. And um, those are things that, that our users are asking for. Um, um, one thing that is, is maybe in, in, interesting to mention is pod churn. Like with, with a lot of um, uh, work happening currently in the community towards better support for batch workloads in, on top of Kubernetes. Um, Pod churn is, is one of the, the most uh, most frequently asked uh, asked uh, 
questions about uh, fr from the users. So um, they are basically asking us how, like the, we would like to support many more. Uh, can we create how many pods per second we can create in the cluster? And, and th th this is one of the dimensions that is probably the, the most frequently asked currently as something that we should we should improve. Um, Okay, so what is this scalability envelope? I mentioned this. So the scalability envelope is, is a zone within which, or a, a subset of this, this multidimensional space within which your cluster is supposed to be happy. Um, what does it really mean that it's cl the cluster is happy? It basically means that like the scalability SLOs are satisfied. So, so basically, if you are within this Subspace, subspace within this scalability envelope, it means that like yours or our scalability SLOs um, will be sat or at least should be satisfied. Um, so um, I hope that you are familiar with this this terminology, but just very quickly, like SLI is service level indicator, and it's like you can conceptually think about it as as a metric. SLO um, is service level objective. You can conceptually think about it as like um, Met that metric plus a threshold that, that needs to be satisfied in order to SLO, um, in order the SLO to be satisfied. So we have a couple SLOs defined for for um, for Kubernetes for scalability of Kubernetes. Um, as you can see, they are definitely not covering like the the, the all surface of Kubernetes. In fact, they are covering probably less than a half or significantly less than a half and it's it's not definitely it's not the desired state we would like to to to, to have much bigger coverage um but it requires a lot of work and it's it's one of the areas where um you can many of you can help hopefully um so if you are working on a feature like it would be good to 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 reach out to six scalability and and also Think about what, like how you can measure, how we can measure it, how we can define the scalability limits of, of your area, and so on. And um, so, um, please reach out and 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 let's work together on extending this this coverage, and make it better for for our users. Um, okay, so let, let's uh, look into one of one example of like SLO um, here, um, and and let's let's talk about like um, API call latency SLO. Um, then the first mention of this SLO is coming from my blog post from 2015, when it was formulated as like 99% of all our API calls return in less than one second, which is something, but it's, it has many problems with it. Um, in particular, I bet that uh, my understanding of that and your understanding of that is, is slightly different. Um, I would even say a little bit more. It's even that my understanding of this SLO now and my understanding when I was writing it, even those were different. So um, one of the, the core principles when defining SLOs that they, they need to be very precise because it's, it's effectively our contract with our users. Um, so we need to ensure that what we want to, um, we want to, what we want to guarantee for them is exactly how they understand those guarantees. So. Uh, how, it, how this SLO looks like today, um, we at least like we or we finally split into the like, actual SLI and SLO. And um, the SLI is, is currently the latency of processing. The processing part was added like a couple weeks ago um, to, to basically exclude the the waiting time. With this, like um, one of the things that is happening in Kubernetes currently is uh, is adding the, the a API priority and fairness to the API server, which is which is basically our overload protection, um, and one of the consequences of that is that like requests that are being in 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 case the control plane is overloaded by the load coming from different clients, um, many some requests may be hanging in the queue before they start being processing uh, before being they start being processed, um, so. Given that it's, it's basically depending on the load on, on the control plane, we can't really provide any guarantees about that. So we are, we are basically excluding this, this waiting time, that, or the time those requests are spending waiting in, in those queues. So, um, so this is this, this processing. So like every single word, basically every single word in, 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 the, um, in the, S, 
both SLI and SLO definitions actually matters. Um, the mutating part, we have a sibling SLO also for read only just with like slightly different thresholds. Um, the single object is, is also something important because it excludes delete collection. We can't guarantee like low enough thresholds for delete collections that is that may potentially want to delete like hundred thousand of objects in one call. Um, uh, the, for every resource verper shows that we are not really putting everything into single bag, but we are treating every every request type like post pods or put endpoint slices or whatever like separately and like for and and finally like measured as like 99th percentile over last five minutes shows exactly like how we are how we are measuring like over what period and so on so um this is um this is super important to make it precise to, to ensure that like we all understand the way we measure it is is the way like everyone understands it and the slo similarly like um in default kubernetes installation this is Similar to the like processing word, we want to exclude the webhooks, which we, which any user or any operator can like install whatever they want, and we have no control over that. So we can like they can potentially even install a webhook that will be sleeping for ten seconds and not doing anything else. So we wouldn't be able to guarantee anything in that point. So we want to exclude that, and and, and then we are saying that for every such resource verb per. Excluding virtual and aggregated resources, that, that's another thing. But um, the 99th percentile per cluster day is less than one second. So um, I think that the, the SLOs are, are super important because that's exactly what how we define like scalability. Um, it's part of the scalability definition. So it's important. Like if um, if you are interested a little bit more in this topic, I had a talk like in Barcelona, if I remember correctly, that was purely focused on like SLIs and SLOs. Um, in Kubernetes, so so you may want to watch if you are interested in this topic. But um, let's move on. Um, we have those SLOs we, we, that define us um, this scalability envelope, but that is very implicit defi definition. So it's it's not exactly what our users want. Um, and unfortunately, like precisely um, defining the scalability envelope is is almost impossible. Um, and it's it's not what our users want. The, the, they they really want to understand if like the, their setup is within this envelope or not. And fortunately, we can actually approximate it relatively simply by like um, providing different um, different dimensions, like number of nodes less than five thousand, number of services less than ten thousand, and so on. Um, there are there are many of those limits. Um, you can look into the link after the presentation. Many of them are still marked as to do, and it's again something we would like to fill in. And um, if you want to help with filling that in, um, that would be that would be great. And reach, reach out to us, and let's make that um, better for our users. Um, okay, so um, that's mostly about like defining scalability. So let's see um, a little bit more on how we are. Actually, how we are measuring those SLOs, what we are testing, how we are testing, and so on. So, um, over over last couple of years, we defined or we built like a, a bunch of scalability testing infrastructure. Um, the the first and probably the most important thing is um, our testing framework called Cluster Loader Two. Um, it's basically effectively a, like a bring your own YAML test framework where as a user or as a test creator, you are semi-declaratively describing the desired state of the cluster. And the cluster holder behind the scenes is bringing your cluster to that state and, um, and verifying whether all those SLOs that I, I mentioned before um, are actually satisfied. Uh, why semi-declaratively? Because in addition to defining this, the actual state of the cluster that, for example, I want like 10,000 pods across 500 deployments and another thousand of stateful jobs, uh, stateful sets, and so on and so on. Um, you, you also can define a little bit how the creation or the updates or whatever should be spread over time. So for example, saying that I want those, those pods to be, or those deployments to be created over the evenly across like five minutes or something like that. Um, it was designed for like easy extensibility so adding new SLOs, adding um, new new 
functionality, so helper functionalities should be relatively simple to do that. Um, it already provides a bunch of like extra observability, bunch of extra features. Um, so, but you, you can read a little bit more. We don't have enough time to, to go over all of those today. So um, you can you can read a little bit more about that in the in our documentation. And I will go to the next thing, which is um, cluster simulation tool called we, we called it CubeMark. We built it like a couple of years ago, which is um, which is a tool that allows us to simulate the Kubernetes or large Kubernetes clusters with much less capacity. The, um, uh, with much less capacity. So that, that is primarily focused on uh, validating scalability or performance um, of the control plane itself. So what we are doing is we are running a regular control plane, a regular co Kubernetes control plane, just we are faking a little bit the nodes that are, the, the nodes of the cluster. So um, we call them hollow nodes and those are almost, almost uh, regular or almost regular um, Kubernetes no node components like kubelet and kube proxy and so on, just they are faking some of their stuff. So, uh, so for example, like kubelet, it, it's an actual kubelet code, but underneath it's not really like the um, the CRI is actually faked there, and it's not really starting any pods or anything like that. It's just pretending it started them. And or similarly for kube proxy, it's it's like watching all the uh, services and endpoint slices and so on, computing how the IP tables should, should be looking at, but it's not updating the real IP tables and so on. So, so we are actually running those as pods in some other different cluster. And thanks to that, we can, we can simulate the actual large cluster with roughly like 10% of capacity that would be needed to run this cluster, um, run this cl really run this cluster. Um, um, to relearn this cluster. Um, okay, so the next thing is observability and debuggability of, of our tests in general. So we have a couple tools here. The first one is perf dash that allows us to track how a certain metric that we are interested in, um, like we have many of those, but um, how a given metric is, is looking over time. So how certain things that we are doing or we are not doing, but they are happening for example, regressions and so on. When those happens, how, how exactly that looks like over time and so on. Um, if we are, if we want to debug a single in uh, or look into into a single um, single test run, we are generally using Grafana. Um, we have a bunch of like defined dashboards for that. Um, uh, we have like a custom tooling that makes it super easy to set this up for, for a given test. It's, it's literally a single comment and so on. And it's, it's, and it's what we are using for, um, for debugging a single test. Um, and finally, like profiling is another thing that we are, we are often using. It's, it's natively integrated into cluster loader, so it's, it's, you can just request it and it will happen out of the box for you if you, if you want. Um, Okay, so this is about the infrastructure. So how we are using it to, to actually verify the performance or how we are, and how we are like primarily protecting Kubernetes scalability. Um, so we have like a, the main test that we called load test, which is, which is basically supposed to stress the control plane of the cluster. It creates a bunch of like pods, um, deployments, stateful sets, persistent volumes, services, and so on, and like it's, it's stressing the control plane. Um, this is um, this is a release blocking test, so um, it's we are running it at scale like of 100 nodes and 5,000 nodes periodically. Um, it's something that we like. Release team is also paying for uh, paying attention to. So um, um, it, it, it's an important thing to, to keep in mind. We used to also have like pre-submit tests um, at the scale of 100 nodes. You might. If you are contributing, you might be probably familiar with them. Um, they are no longer required at this point. They are only optional if you if you explicitly trigger them, which is good to, good thing to, to do with um, if you are not entirely sure like how your change um, is affecting the system. But due to the cost cuttings that we had to do, that you might have heard, like we are 
we are on track to be out of the budget for like second half of the year or second um, last quarter of the year. Um, we, we had to do a bunch of cuttings across the whole project to, to reduce the cost of our infrastructure and like um, that was one of the areas that was hit by, 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 by all of that. So they, are, they still exist, they are just like optional and not, not run not running by default. And we have a bunch of like other tests like cube mark test, benchmark and so on. And, um, if you are interested a little to learning to learn a little bit more about them, like there is like a, we have a whole six scalability dashboard when where all of those um, tests are actually shown. Um, they are fortunately fairly stable at this point. So um, some regressions are happening from time to time, but I think we didn't have really any in the last release, for example. So it's it's much better than it used to be like a couple of years ago, where we were facing like m multiple regressions per release usually. Um, okay, so um, about the regressions, uh, it's it's worth mentioning that uh, they are happening across all the system. Like obviously, many of them were in API server or scheduler or like the core control core, core um, control plane components but we had a bunch of regressions with in kubelet or kube proxy or, or, or and so on um, because in a in a like in a large clusters that the number of those is, is like the, the multiplying factor of how many of those is is, is super important but we also have like, like regressions in in go itself like the go like the the newer versions of Go were making our components behave differently and introducing regressions. We had, like, we have, we, we've seen uh, regressions in operating system themselves. So um, even if, like, from the first glance, like, the thing that you are working on um, doesn't look like like scalability related, like, it's it's always important to keep the scalability in the back of your mind when you are working on whatever change in, 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 in the system. Um, okay, and the, the last thing, which is usually the most interesting for, for many people, which is like driving the scalability improvement. So what, what we are doing here, um, unfortunately less than we would like to do, again, due to capacity um, constraints, but there are still a couple things that are worth mentioning from the last uh, two, three releases or so. Um, the, like, given that scalab six scalability is not really owning any non-test code or non-test framework code, um, like most of them are, are generally joined with some other six. Majority of them is, is like joined with six API machinery, um, but we are like heavily contributing or driving those um, those things ourselves, um, just under supervision of, of, of that other SIG. And um, the things that are worth mentioning here is like the API priority and fairness. Um, it's, it's the overall protection in the API server that we are, we are adding and we are working on that for like last nine releases or something. That's, that's a huge thing that we are, we are doing at a huge change. Um, in the, the biggest, the biggest um, advantage from it is, is obviously reliability. It's like overall protection. Um, but um, this, is, this also matters for scalability because like you can think about scalability, like the way we are thinking about scalability is, is that scalability is really a reliability at scale. So reliability is like in the core of scalability. Um, but there are also like other aspects of, of priority and fairness that are important here, which is that are purely scalability related is, is um, the system throughput that I mentioned before that is appearing um, a lot in terms of, in the context of, of batch workloads. Um, API priority and fairness is actually an enabler for that um, because um, the throughput in, in many places across the system is actually artificially blocked a little bit today by, by our QPS limits on the client side um, for communication with API server or the control plane in general. Um, and the only way we can get rid of them is to really um, make overall protection on the server side uh, like robust because otherwise 
um, those clients could potentially break the control plane completely. So, so it's, it's critical to, or it's actually an enabler. There are many different things that we would have to do, but it's an, an enabler for um, improving the system throughput in general. Um, streaming wrists are another thing, which is, which is also, again, a little bit more on the reliability area than the scalability area, but those are like tightly coupled with each other. The idea here is that instead of like the, the way we are thinking about getting all the resources, so send a request and get all the response, response back, is, use, um, is here use the watch protocol for getting all the data. So getting the list data, but using the watch protocol. Um, it's something that went alpha in 127, like a couple weeks ago, last week, I think, was the reason. Um, um, and it's, it's, it's hugely helping for memory consumption of, of API server, but it's also helping a lot for, um, for ve very large collections. So if, if, we, if you have like gigabytes of data, so like let's say you, have, you want to have 100,000 of pods and like they can actually be relatively large. If, if you are end up ha having, um, um, having gigabytes of data, then just downloading them in a single API call is, is just time consuming. And it can even exceed the, the, the limit of like one minute that we have for all API, API requests. And with um, switching that to watch, we are actually um, working around that, that limitation. Um, graceful shutdown is another interesting thing that uh, that we did it's 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 we've seen a bunch of cases where the, act, the once the cluster is is working and stable that it it works fine but even without any changes to the load if you try to recreate the control plane or or like upgrade the control plane and so on that was like blowing up the cluster so and the reason was primarily watches so like there are in the biggest clusters we observe like even hundreds of thousands of watches so if we bring down one of the API server or a couple of API servers at the same time, um, suddenly all those watches that were established and in a, like, just worked um, in a stable state, they suddenly all want to recreate or reestablish themselves again at the same time. So that was like blowing up um, control plane completely. In some cases, even, uh, even to the extent that it couldn't like, um, um, recreate itself correctly um, at all. So, so that was something that was also improved in the, in the 127 release and a bunch of like other smaller things. Um, um, unfortunately, we don't have much time to, to talk about them. So um, one thing that I want to mention like at the, at the end again is uh, you might have seen me or someone else like rejecting some of the improvements. Um, it's important to um, that Something to, to, to get back to what I initially said at the beginning is um, we, sh we shouldn't be optimizing the system for the sake of the optimizing. Like I, I've seen the optimizations that like they were improving like by 1% one of the random functions somewhere and they were introducing like hundreds of lines of code. That's not really something that we really want. So um, it's important to, to keep the complexity versus like return on investment trade-off in, in the back of your mind when you are on to optimize something. Um, and yeah, so um, if you are interested in any of those, like um, as you have seen, like we need help and we have like a bunch of work that it would be great to, to have done in many, in all those areas, like please reach out to us, please join our, um, our bi-weekly meetings, reach out to us on, um, on Slack channel mailing list or whatever, and let's, um, let's help us to make the system better for our users. Um, and with that, I think we have five more minutes or something. Yes, five more minutes. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Um, that's all what I have um, prepared for today. Yeah, it's on. Hi, Wojtek. Uh, excellent presentation. Thanks for that. And. Uh, from the user perspective, we know that many organizations tend to have more than one cluster. And can you reveal some tips for, for those who want to divide the workloads among many clusters? For example, which kind of workloads are so intensive in terms of performance that they could you know, impact other workloads? So 
Can, can you share some, you know, some, some tips for, for that? Yeah, I, um, sure, yeah, that, 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 that's a great question. Like, and it's something that we, um, in really, in order to be done correctly, it's something we need to cooperate more deeply with um, multi-cluster SIG, so it's, it's somewhere in between. Um, but, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, I think that th there isn't like a strict rule that like those should be running together and those like shouldn't be running together. Um, I think that in general networking area is, is the most stressing for the control plane. It's, and it's where, we, when we, where we've seen the biggest number of like um, issues. Um, so uh, I think networking in general, like how how your how your how whole your networking stack works like it, it's it's also very different between like cloud providers or whatever technology you are running if you're running it or on bare metal and, and, and so on those have like very different characteristics so it's 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 important to keep it in mind but it's also important to, even when you are using like um, cube proxy based stack or cilium based stack or whatever those, those are also um, super heavy for 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 the control plane so uh, understanding like how big churn for for all, like you will observe in your on your services and so on that that may be a, a, a significant factor of how to split your workloads across so like clusters multiple services, so thousands yeah thousands of services especially like thousands of stable services that just are there are usually fine but like if, if there's like a big churn of in all of those, that, that is like what is um, often problematic. Um, the current scalability limits of 5,000 nodes, um, I know that was quite a, a few years back that that came about, and there's been loads and loads of work going on since then. Are there any plans to kind of revisit that limit or see if we can test beyond it? And what are the current bottlenecks that you're seeing? Um, so um, to, be, to be honest, like um, this is what we officially support in, 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 in the open source stack. Like, um, Internally in Google, where, when I'm working, like the GKE supports like 15,000 node clusters, and underneath we are using over, uh, like like open source Kubernetes. It, we are just tuning it differently and setting, but it's not that we are like have gazillion patches that are improving that. So um, it's definitely not a hard limit like the 5,000 nodes. It's um, it just like um, many of the like the, the ecosystem around is is needs to be improved also so like there, there are all of the all of those all of those things around that would need to be improved um there we don't have any plans to push it farther really in open source because a it's expensive to test for regressions and so on and so on um and second uh, there isn't much desire from like the, the actual users for that, and 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 we are getting back to like, if people don't need it, let let's not complicate the system. So, um, at least for now, like we are we are focusing more on pushing those other aspects like pod throughput, for example, or system throughput in general, and so on. And we don't have any plans to do that at least in the next year or two for pushing this the, the size of the cluster. Makes sense. So it's largely you're, you're seeing a lot with like other external factors like third-party control is there as well and is that like etcd is that one of the issues there or is it just like the sheer number of watches and bad um etcd is becoming to be a bottleneck but we are running in gk also with uh, with etcd underneath so it's it's possible to do that so um yes hi if you hit a scalability issue what is the first step you would do to diagnose where the problem is because I, I, I'm a bit blind when I see Kubernetes. It's, it's hanging or everything stopped working. I don't know where, where the problem is here. Um, this is a good question and I, I don't have a good answer to, to, to it, to be honest. Like, I mean, um, usually the scalability, question, uh, scalability problems are the toughest one to debug. And like, there are many, like, even in, in, in our team and like GK team, like there aren't that many people who can who can debug those so it's 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 a matter of like having expertise and understand the whole kubernetes and like looking a little bit like what was happening in the, in the cluster looking into metrics like gazillion of different metrics and trying to to have some intuition so i i don't have really a good answer uh, is there that. dash you saw i saw a dashboard there on your slides can this be used to see where bottlenecks sure yeah th th those those are like um yes um, i mean 
in at least in some cases they, they are helpful so the, the dashboards the grafana dashboards that we have um, are are open source they, they are like in our our like perf test repository and they can be used on a live cluster too um, uh, they can be used yes yeah. you, you can just like um, yes yes basically like if you if you are using prometheus or, or something like that you can just uh, just just like um, open them for your cluster and, and try to look, to look how this. So, so yes, um, if um, I, yes, I recommend looking into them. They they may they in many cases they might help you um, to see what is happening there. Okay, I think we are running out of time. I don't know. Yeah, one I think question. we have like one oh, more question. We or don't or have not? time at all. Okay. So maybe the last uh, one uh, last question. You can one question. Okay, who was first? I'm happy to answer like some offline questions okay. too um, after the presentation. Uh, is there some subset of, of the, the current tests that uh, someone uh, developing an, uh, an operator uh, run to check that it like has uh, uh, the, to, to find the, how scalable it is, uh, w where it breaks and, and stuff like that? So, um, Yes and no. Um, I mean, like all the tests are there available, so you can you can run them. It's it's a matter of like, do you have an like infrastructure to run it? Like you can you, we can, you can do that as a pre-submit for your PR once you have something working. Um, so so that is that is one potential. Um, the the caveat here is that they are not really covering all aspects of the system. So if if you are looking into if you are working on I don't know, some random feature on the node site, and like our tests probably don't exercise it at all. Um, so um, it, it really depends what exactly you are, you are, um, you are doing. Okay, I, I think we are um, I'm out of time. I, I'm around here like until the end of week, so feel free to um, grab me on the corridor and, and, or whatever, and I'm happy to chat more with you. Um, and um, thank you very much for, for joining. <laughs>